iPhone 8. Why would Apple call it that? Commentary Many seem confident that Apple will soon present two phones called iPhone 7S and iPhone 7S Plus and an iPhone 8. Is that the best Apple can do? Many people seem to know the name of these babies, even before the babies are born. And before the parents have said anything, even whether there are three of them at all. Apparently, it's going to be iPhone 7S, iPhone 7S Plus and iPhone 8. The first two are supposed to be updates with some allegedly exciting extras, such as wireless charging and better cameras. The last one is said to be the radical redesign, with an old screen and without a puzzle. The received wisdom has it that Apple has followed such supposed numerical rules many times before. An odd year gets an S phone. A totally new phone gets the next number up. I have numerous reasons to be skeptical. Not least is my imagined first line of Tim Cook's announcement. We have some great new phones for you today. Some feel a bit old, but the last one's really exciting. Would Apple really name its phones so the two feel like last year's and the third is the only one you should be excited about? Wouldn't the company prefer that each one be part of a new family, so that each can harbor its own level of excitement? This year is the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. The newest phone is said to actually be substantially different from the last. At last. Why, then, would Apple think without substantial difference about what it should be called? Many people skipped the last upgrade, as the iPhone 7 resembled iPhone 6 just a little too much, especially in terms of physical design. Why make them feel they're getting a substantial novelty by calling all the newest phones iPhone 10s? Certainly, that's one of the possibilities that my colleague John Falcon floated when he looked at the rumored choices. But I have more reasons why the currently rumored names feel dull. Why would you launch two phones with the iPhone 7 moniker, when Samsung, by the time Apple announces, will have already launched two phones called Galaxy S8? Why not, at the very least, call your updated phones iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, or even iPhone 9 and 9 Plus, and make the newest phone the iPhone 10? Or why not just call them all iPhone 10s? Yours is only a 7. Oh, dear. At the crudest psychological level, and, as we've surely noticed in recent times, human psychology has some highly crude aspects, wouldn't you rather have a 9 or a 10 than an 8? If Apple calls its phones 8s, just like Samsung's, it's almost a subliminal admission that each brand's respective phones really aren't too dissimilar. It's like BMW releasing its 3 Series cars and then Audi releasing cars also called 3 Series. And there I was thinking marketing was about differentiation. Some fancy that the newest, top of the line, possibly very expensive if phone will be called iPhone Pro. Just as the iPad now has an iPad Pro. I'm anti that. The Pro part tries to convince you of that. The mere thought of a phone that's now primarily a business tool immediately takes some excitement away from what has always been a personal device. Business is not about excitement. I'm naive enough to be fond of excitement. Then again, perhaps that's precisely where Apple is aiming. Some smart money will therefore surely go on the first two phones being iPhone 10 and iPhone 10 Plus and the fanciest one iPhone 10 Pro. This is all, though, theoretical entertainment. You could even argue that it has to be the iPhone 8 series because the number 8 is lucky in China. But what if there aren't three phones? What if there are only two? What if there are four? What if the fanciest phone won't be available for six months? Thank you for watching. For the follow-up, subscribe to the channel yourself here. Enough evidence from previous launches that Tim Cook has something else in mind. With all the talk of the iPhone 8 online, it's unlikely that even Apple's ivory tower view of the media would release three handsets with numbers lower than eight. Which means you have a basic model, a plus-sized phablet, and a highly specified and insanely expensive model. Apple already has a pattern for this, so let's reconfigure the lineup around the hip new labels and fit in with the numbering scheme to offer us the iPhone 8, iPhone 8 Plus, and iPhone 8 Pro. Except Tim Cook apparently has arithmophobia, so let's drop the 8 bomb and regenerate the lineup in the 10th anniversary of the first Apple smartphone. iPhone 
iPhone Plus, iPhone Pro. Some justification on the new naming conventions here. Can Apple really live without Touch ID? Touch ID, the biometric fingerprint scanner on the iPhone range devices, looks set to be missing from the iPhone 8. Thanks to the removal of the home button, Touch ID would have needed a new home in any case. Options such as embedding it in the power button or using the Apple logo on the rear chassis have been mentioned, but these are being ignored. Tim Cook is going to gamble on losing Touch ID altogether and rely on facial recognition. As leaked in its own software, Apple will instead move all iPhone 8 security to Face ID, a new facial recognition that will hopefully work better than Samsung's erratic implementation in the Galaxy S8 and Galaxy S8 Plus which struggles in bright sunlight, low light and when wearing glasses slash sunglasses. But Samsung played it safer than Apple because both the Galaxy S8 and Galaxy S8 Plus still retain their fingerprint sensors as a fallback. They are idiotically positioned, but they were still my default method of unlock within a week of using each phone. More here on Forbes. Improving your portrait. Lurking inside the latest iOS 11 beta releases new code for Apple's portrait mode. This is the dual camera powered bokeh effect where the subject is in sharp focus while the background goes out of focus. Apple has refreshed the settings, but also stores data of the original image capture so you can remove the effect for a clean portrait at a later time. Mike Weatherly has more. Portrait mode not only has exited its beta status, but has seen some improvements as well. The procedure to take the shot is unmodified, but the edit feature now allows for the effect to be removed at will, and non-destructively. The effect still can't be applied retroactively if the image wasn't taken in portrait mode to begin with. All the details are at Apple Insider. Calling Dick Tracy, Apple Style. For a companion device, a lot of people want the Apple Watch to operate independently from the host iPhone or iPad. Apple more than likely has the technology to do so inside Cupertino's labs, but is it ready for the public? Bloomberg's Mark Gurman believes so. Currently, Apple requires its smartwatch to be connected wirelessly to an iPhone to stream music, download directions and maps, and send messages while on the go. Equipped with LTE chips, at least some new Apple Watch models, planned for release by the end of the year, will be able to conduct many tasks without an iPhone in range, the people said. For example, a user would be able to download new songs and use apps and leave their smartphone at home. More on the unconnected Apple Watch potential here. Go large an option for new MacBook Pro. As it stands, the MacBook Pro machines top out at 2TB of storage, provided by a pair of 1TB VNN package. Now that the South Korean company has been able to increase the size of these chips, Apple will have the option to ship a Mac machine with a whopping 4TB of storage in the near future. Samsung announced a 1TB VNN chip that it expects to be available next year. Initially mentioned in 2013, during unveiling of the industry's first third mint, Samsung has been working to enable its core memory technologies to realize one terabit of capacity on a single chip using a VNN structure. The arrival of a 1TB VNN chip next year will enable 2TB of memory in a single VNN package. More at Samsung, and a tip of the hat to Ben Lovejoy. And finally, Following the lukewarm reception to Planet of the Apps, Apple's second original series has debuted and the reaction has not improved by much. Carpool Carao takes the short format sketch from the Late Late Show, puts it over to Apple's distribution system and increases the runtime. Has it worked? Rebecca Nicholson reviews the show. Apple has supersized his formula but, in doing so, has managed to misunderstand entirely what it is that made it charming. Judging by the first episode and what's teased later in the series, this is less about getting a revealing interview out of someone who may otherwise seem distant, and more about bowing down to the power of celebrity. Will Smith, who stars in the first episode, isn't there to have a conversation with Corden. Who's there to perform? The full review is at The Guardian. Apple Loop brings you 7 days worth of highlights every weekend here on Forbes. Don't forget to follow me so you don't miss any coverage in the future. Last week's Apple Loop can be read here, or this week's edition of Loop's sister column, Android Circuit, is also available on Forbes. Thank you for watching. For the follow-up, subscribe to the channel yourself here.